Ladies and gentlemen, Marshall Brown. Hello, I'm Marshall Brown. Welcome back to Water Matters. You probably heard that dolphins are highly intelligent animals that communicate with each other using a fairly sophisticated set of sounds. Imagine if we could fully understand our language. What would they be telling us? Today on Water Matters, I'm delighted to welcome one of our island's top experts on the creatures in the sea around us, Dr. Artie Kopelman. He'll show you things you never expected to see and talk about how our actions here on dry land are impacting our friends in the sea. That's all coming up on this edition of Water Matters, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Live from the Grassroots Studio in beautiful downtown Port Washington, this is Water Matters with host Marshall Brown and special guest Dr. Artie Koppelman. Brought to you by the Jump In Campaign and made possible in part by funding from the Long Island Community Foundation. And now, here again is your host, Marshall Brown. Welcome back to Water Matters. I'm here with Dr. Artie Kopelman, president of the Coastal Research and Education Society of Long Island, and an expert on the creatures of the sea around us, especially the big ones. Artie, it's great to see you, and I'll let you take it from here. All right, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about is essentially about the marine mammals and a little bit of maybe the sea turtles here in New York in Long Island's waters. Um, what we sometimes call the charismatic megafauna and what they t can tell us and of course um, how we affect them as well. So it's going to uh, give you some basic introductions. What we have here are two groups of marine mammals. These are the cetaceans, the whales, dolphins and porpoises and the pinnipeds. Though pinnipeds include sea lion seals and, and walruses, what we have here are the seals or true seals. So. Let me give you a little quick overview in terms of cetaceans. There are 85 recognized species of cetaceans in the world. And here in the waters of New York, we've got nearly 25% of that. So we've got about 20 species here. Um, and um, some are here year round, some are here um, in migration, some are here as nomads, and, and some here just haven't read the textbooks, don't know they're not supposed to be here. And our cetaceans are divided up into two fundamental groups that still exist. One are the toothed whales, the odontocetes, and the other the mysticetes, which translates from Latin as mustache whales, but actually are the baleen whales. So just uh, this is one of those slides that no one likes, a lot of information, just to give you an idea that we, our baleen whales range in size from the relatively small uh, minke whale here to the largest of the baleen whales, the blue whale. And our odontocetes range from the small um, harbor porpoise all the way up to the largest of the uh, toothed whales, the, the sperm whale. We also have seals here, um, two fairly common species of seals and three others that are not as common. And these are the common ones are the harbor seal uh, and the gray seal. And then uh, what we call the ice seals or the ice loving seals, harp seals, hooded seals, and ring seals. Many of these um, marine mammals can act as what we refer to as sentinel species. These are species that give us an idea, give us a warning because they may be affected first before us. It's like the story of the canary in a coal mine. Um, the ones that are really sentinel species are the top level predators and these are the pinnipeds and the odontocetes, the, the seals and, and the toothed whales. Um, and what we can learn, what we find out from them is uh, when they get uh, fairly high levels, unfortunately, of fat soluble poisons. The story of um, biological magnification where you get an increase in concentration of fat soluble toxins um, as you go higher and higher. Um, in, in the food webs. And these include things like uh, PCBs, dioxins, organochlorine pesticides, uh, methylmercury, and from way back, DDT is a classic example. Um, 
I want to talk to you first about the sperm whales. Um, this is one of the few photographs that I haven't, that I didn't take. Sperm whales are massive. Males get up to 60 feet long and females are around 38 feet long. Um, and they're about 2,300, the most recent estimate for the western North Atlantic. Um, New York is unusual in that um, we have sperm whales that can be seen fairly close to shore in fairly shallow water in um, winter, spring, and right in through, uh, through June. Uh, usually they're found up in, at the edge of the continental shelf in really deep water, and we know we can go out there and find them, but we can find them close in as well. In fact, this past summer, um, there were a group of, of young males uh, right off of Block Island throughout most of the summer and briefly off of Montauk as well. Uh, you can see here that the whale is, is exhaling, and, and that's the whale's blow, and that's how we find them. This is one of our very common Oh my goodness, it's called the common dolphin, right? This is the short beak common dolphin, one of the most common of the toothed whales. And um, there are around 173,000 in the western North Atlantic. They're social animals. They live in social groups of uh, 20 or so, um, although occasionally you find aggregations of, of scores of individuals and sometimes super aggregations of thousands. And yes, this dolphin is jumping out of the water not because someone's dangling a fish, but maybe we want to know why they jump. We'll see in a second. This is a mom and her calf. That calf is a newborn. If you look on the side of the calf, you see these lines up and down. Those are from being in the fetal position. They're called fetal folds. And they disappear in a few months. So this one is anywhere from a few weeks to a few months old. And yes, sometimes we see aggregations and super aggregations on this day. Um, we had about 650 uh, short beak common dolphins. And yes, they're, they're jumping out of the water, and we see this often. And the question is, why? Why do this porpoising behavior? You ever try and run through water versus running through air? It takes a lot more energy to, to move through the, through the water. And when these animals are, are swimming rapidly, they do have to come up and breathe. And as they get close to the surface of the water, they experience really strong drag. So what they do is jump out of the water, move through the air to save energy. That's why they porpoise. That's why they do that. Here's another one doing the same thing. Why save energy? Whatever energy you save goes into this. This is copulation. These are two dolphins. This is maybe we call it dolphin porn, maybe. But these are, are copulating dolphins, and of course, Reproduction is key to uh, continuing. Um, how else can dolphins save energy? You guys, maybe you've been on, on boats and seen dolphins ride your bow wave or bow wave. Sure, they'll do that. And they're being pulled along by the pressure, and that's how you save energy. They don't just do it to boats, they'll do it to whales as well. These are two dolphins that are drafting that, that large female um, sper uh, fin whale. Um, this was back in 2013. Just to give you an idea, on that day we had 25 fin whales, 12 humpback whales, um, about 650 common dolphins 12 miles south-southeast of Montauk. Um, we also have bottlenose dolphins. There are a couple of different um, subspecies that are found here. This, what you're looking at, is the inshore bottlenose dolphin. They are um, found close to shore in shallower, warmer waters. And prior to 2009, we're never seen in any appreciable numbers north of New Jersey. 2009, we start to see them along the coast of Long Island. And, and for many, many years, particularly the years when it, sea surface temperatures are really warm, incredibly high numbers of these animals. Further offshore, in cooler, uh, deeper waters, and these were the predominant ones until fairly recently. Uh, we have the offshore bottlenose dolphins. They're much bigger. And occasionally, um, the inshore and the offshore ones don't read the textbooks, and you may find them sort of switching place periodically. But this is 120 miles out at sea, um, just in case you're wondering. And there are a lot more of them, around 70, 78,000. Um, belugas. It's a photograph of belugas at uh, Coney Island Aquarium. It's a mom and her calf. The calf is a gray one, and for some reason, um, the belugas there love to have their tongue scratched. It's a strange feeling putting your hands inside the mouth of a toothed whale. But 
Um, do we have belugas in the wild? Not usually. These are the ones that don't read the textbook. Up until last year, they're really the most recent known beluga in Long Island Sound was there for about 14 months and at one point in 1986 was found shot to death. This is obviously illegal. It was found shot to death in, in, in New Haven Harbor. Jump ahead 30 years. 2015, we have two belugas, um, and this was photographed in uh, Long Island Sound, actually not far from here, right? Not being shot, not being harassed, and eventually they left this area and headed down to the Jersey Shore the last time they were seen, um, and it was three of them were actually in the Shrewsbury and Navis St. Rivers. Uh, not a great place to be for any um, marine mammal. I don't think we ever heard from them after that, but they may have um, left, hopefully, and went back north. We have our, our, our baleen whales. What you're looking at here is a, a humpback whale. Um, humpback whales are doing really well. There are about um, 12,000 in the western North Atlantic. The whales that are found around here our humpbacks are part of what we call the Gulf of Maine stock, um, and at that latest estimate, there are around 823 individuals. We've been lucky enough in our trips to have encountered uh, over 900 encounters of humpback whales, both here in New York and out in the Great South Channel, and have identified 370 individuals. Um, they're, they're pretty cool. Uh, this is a cool animal, too. Um, I was there that day. This is not my photograph. This is a blue whale. A uh, blue whale off the coast of Montauk. Blue whales are the largest animals ever to have left. The record length for a blue whale. It's a female from Whaling Station. In 1963, she was 110 feet long. The record weight was another female in 63 at a Whaling Station. This is just before it became illegal to, to kill them, and she weighed 386,000 pounds. We also have right whales here. Right whales are perhaps some of the rarest of the baleen whales. When I started, there were 250, we thought, and I've been at this for 30 years. Um, today, there are, we think, about 500. These are right whales right off the coast of Montauk from this past August. This is the first time that I've seen right whales close. You can't come closer than 500 yards to, uh, to right whales. There are two males, um, both identified by their markings over there. Right whales get the name of the right whale because they were the right whale to hunt because they were slow movers. It had lots of blubber and lots of baleen, and because they're slow movers, they get hit. And what you're seeing here is the, the consequence of uh, a vessel encounter. Uh, baleen whales have our filter feeders. They've got these plates of overlapping uh, tissue called baleen hanging down from their upper jaw. What you're looking at is a humpback whale, and it's mouth open. And um, he or she is about to take in a mouthful of food and water. Humpback whales can take in about 5,000 gallons in a mouthful. A uh, fin whale, which you saw earlier, can take in 23,000 gallons in a mouthful. But they're quite effective. Ah, fin whale, all right? Fin whales are the second largest animal ever to have lived, uh, second largest whale, and they are our most uh, um, abundant large whale here off the coast of New York. Uh, they, like the humpback whale, are endangered, and the blue whale is endangered. Oh, and the right whale is endangered. 2010, we saw this individual, this one had been hit by a boat, had severe lacerations that it healed up, and last summer came back again. Same individual. So obviously, same scars. It's unfortunate that we have to rely upon scars to ID them, but that works, and sometimes they just don't make it. This was one that was hit by a boat and back in 1996. Um, this is off of, of Smith Point. 60 feet, 120,000 pounds of dead rotting whale in, in, in January still stinks. Minky whales are some of the smallest of the whales that we have here. They've got a really short beak and they've got these white patches in there uh, on their flippers and they're fairly abundant, much more abundant than the other ones that we've seen and unfortunately minky whales are still being killed today. Um, even though there has uh, been a moratorium on commercial whaling since 1986 internationally, and, and all marine mammals are protected in U.S. waters and around U.S. vessels. Minke whales are still being hunted. They're being hunted by Norway. They're being hunted, to some extent, by Iceland. They're being hunted by Japan. What you're looking at here is a humpback whale by the name of Springboard um, doing what humpback whales do a lot, and that's breach. 
jumping clear out of the water. Now, humpbacks are, are relatively sort of intermediate in size. Uh, 55 feet, 70,000 pounds compared to a fin whale that's um, 85 feet, 170,000 pounds. But can you imagine the amount of energy needed to do that, to jump clear out of the water? Humpback whales cooperate. Unlike any other whale, they actually work together to feed, to increase their, their, their um, chance of getting food. Our turtles include um, loggerheads, leatherbacks, and green turtles. This is a leatherback turtle. They eat jellyfish. What do you think it's eating? That's a plastic bag. Um, I didn't realize it was a plastic bag until I got home and looked closely at, at that image. One of the reasons why we have to eliminate that stuff, reduce it tremendously, um, not just because of, of the turtles, but others as well. Seals, garbage. That seal there, it's 2010, it's being strangled by, by netting, by rope. Here it is in 2011. Here in 2012 on the far right. And here again in 2016, six years, still being strangled. Um, and it's not the only one, there are others as well. This is, um, an introduction to uh, where I do my work um, this time of year, and that's out at West Hampton Beach at a place called Cupsog Beach. And this is a group of a little over 100 seals that are hauled out. My work involves harbor seals. Um, just to give you an idea, this is a typical harbor seal, kind of dog-like appearance. Check me out, making sure I'm not a threat. But though I'm pretty far away and hiding, it still seemed to uh, want to check. Everyone thinks they're cute and cuddly, where they're not so cute and cuddly. This is a female by the name of Hammerhead Wright that I've known for 11 years, and she sometimes gets ticked off. And so this is a male showing off, and another male showing off. This is a gray seal. Big snouts, unlike, unlike um, harbor seals, this gray seal is a female. Very light markings. This is a big old snouted uh, male. Um, Gray seal set up colonies, and what we discovered, my colleague and I, independently in 2007, was a gray seal rookery or colony on Little Gull Island. And it is clearly a colony, and if you looked in 2012 version of Google Earth, you see it covered in seals, and mostly gray seals. The Arctic seals, the ice-loving seals, the harp-hooded and ring seals, they spend the summertime in the high Arctic. They move to the edge of the ice in autumn, and then have been expanding their range southward for about 35 years in winter. We have no idea why, none at all. Some say it might be food, maybe. But if you think about where places are changing more drastically than anywhere else on the planet, in terms of warming, it's the edge of the ice in the Arctic. And then um, also now in the Antarctic. Could it be that? Could it be that 35 years ago they responded to these changes? I don't know, and I don't know if we can test that, but sounds reasonable. Hooded seals are big. Males get up to 900 pounds. Gray seals only get up to 700 pounds. Um, and this is at a, their normal range, and then they can be found as far south as actually as Puerto Rico. If you're a 900-pound seal, you don't want to be there. Harp seals feed on lots of stuff, um, but, uh, you know, they got um, blamed for the loss of, of the Arctic cod because it's easier to blame the seals and blame us. Of course, we have to deal with things like entanglement and poisons, as we said, uh, harassment, harassment, boats out at Cubside. Um, and whenever we get harassment um, and can document it, it's sent off to the federal authorities, aircraft, this guy came back in, in several different helicopters. He may be the same guy in, in this. And then one day, November 2015, these, 2014, these two guys pull up onto the sandbar. There are two seals. They get off, get scared away. And they get out, pull out shotguns, and start skeet shooting. Why? Who knows? I think in some cases it's on purpose. 
In some cases, it's just stupidity. In some cases, it's this idea of entitlement. They are entitled to do what they want because they can. Let's hope that we can work better to protect all of those species, and maybe you can come out with me and um, see them. What I try and do is get people to see them to make this connection. And once you have that connection, you become a stakeholder, you become concerned, you can work to make a difference. Thank you. causing all these whales to want to abandon the deep water and get the hell out of there. One of the things about noise in the ocean is that humans are not aware of it at all. Listening on the headphones gives you a headache. Within 10 minutes, you have to take the headphones off, and the whales can't turn the volume down. They were trying to get away. You didn't have to have a hydrophone to hear the sonar. I can't imagine what it must have been like underwater. These companies damage the ocean without cost. And the sound of all of those ships literally filled our ocean with noise. There's a direct significant correlation between the amount of ship noise and the physiology and the stress levels in these animals. It seems like we are not able to do anything about it. The one good thing about ocean noise is that when you stop making noise, it goes away. putting the ocean at risk. And if you put the ocean at risk, you're putting all of us at risk. These days, the general public is becoming more and more aware of the serious water problems facing us here on Long Island. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Over the past half century, our water resources have undergone several studies and assessments. They provide numerous recommendations and strategies. Some even offer warnings, now turning out to be prophetic. These studies and reports possess one common thread. They were all approved to stave off the very tipping points threatening Long Island's groundwater today. Okay, so we were warned and told what to do, and we've known it for a long time. So why hasn't Long Island responded? What's been stopping us from saving our water and saving ourselves? Surprisingly, the reason is a simple but quite significant disconnect. Long Island possesses no groundwater management capable of taking report recommendations and strategies and implementing them into resource policy and practice. And no management means no action, none. To solve this disconnect, Long Island must first create an entity capable of executing both policy and practice. The entity must provide expert science-based groundwater management and protection, be independent of politics and private interests, and must be empowered to act officially and proactively. Unfortunately, enacting this concept is a long way off. And while we wait, the studies and reports I mentioned continue to sit on a shelf, abandoned and going to waste sort of like ripe fruit left withering on a vine. So what's stopping us from creating this entity? Well, that's a topic for a whole nother soapbox. But for now, let me just say that by themselves, studies are actually a small part of the solution and a very big part of the fail to act problem. Although critical to prudent management, studies can be a two-edged sword. The proactive edge makes everyone look great, attentive, busy, and aggressive. But then there's the disingenuous edge, 
it provides the perfect smoke screen for faking these virtues and deflecting the follow through. And before you know it, and without anybody realizing it, progress has come to a freezing halt again. Until, of course, the public wakes up and panic sets in again, and the whole we need yet another study cycle repeats itself again and again. Or worse, until the kick can finally comes to the end of its road and the unthinkable happens. Long Island is forced to face the fated demise of its drinking water supply. Is the governor's new groundwater proposal doomed to be just another study-only casualty? Quite possibly. Without a management entity to convert his plans into action, the proposal is sure to stall or derail altogether. Long Island's water resource history has been one big self-defeating sin of omission, and its ongoing legacy could easily be the source of a well-deserved epitaph. They would much rather study their water than save it. The views expressed on the soapbox are not necessarily those of Water Matters, its sponsors, hosts, guests, or underwriters. If you'd like to stand on the Water Matters soapbox and sound off about a water issue, send your script to soapbox at liwater.org. If you get sick, your doctor may give you medicine, and you might have some left over when you get better. So what do you do with it? Here's what, don't ever, ever, like ever, flush drugs down the drain because we're beginning to find them in our water here on Long Island. See, whatever goes down the drain ends up in our drinking water or in our bays and streams. So jump in and help keep Long Island's water clean. Don't flush medicines down the drain. Learn more at liwater.org. Welcome back to Water Matters. My guest today is Dr. Artie Kopelman, president of the Coastal Research and Education Society of Long Island. Artie, I wanted to ask you, first of all, that was amazing, just really getting that uh, up and close and personal with those uh, marine animals, but what can we do on the mainland of Long Island to really uh, protect them and make our ocean guests feel welcome here? Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's a good question. <coughs> I think one of the things you can do, we can do, is um, learn about what's going on out there, get out and see it. Uh, I think what we have to do is limit whatever um, stuff we're putting into the waters, whether we're doing it on purpose or doing it inadvertently. Um, the plastic, the amount of plastic out there and, and balloons, it's obscene. Mm. Um, and there's, there's no reason for that. Um, we need to eliminate the use of any kind of toxins. Mm -hmm. around our homes here on Long Island because whatever toxins we use in our homes, around our homes, end up in the water, mm -hmm. ultimately. Um, and I think we need to make sure that um, we are aware of their presence mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and um, enjoy them. Mm -hmm from a safe distance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, to that last point, uh, you have your, uh, your seal walks uh, through May, uh, and then coming up the, the whale watches. And, uh, so where would one go to, to go on one of those? Um, well, for the seal walks, you'd go to the Cresley website, C-R-E-S-L-I.org, um, and um, up, fill out a, a reservation. We've got a bunch of seal walks coming up. Most of them are filled. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have wait lists. We have a few that have space. Good. Um, and we ask that you come with us so that you learn from me how to observe them, um, photograph them without causing disturbance. Um, for the, the whale trips, we, uh, again, check through our website. We have our local six-hour trips coming up. Um, the wet day of the week, we're not sure yet. We'll find out, hopefully, this week. And then we have our multi-day trip off to the, edge of the, uh, to the Great South Channel. I can't wait for that one. That's going to be great. Now, your first point about bags. Uh, isn't there a bill pending uh, with the Suffolk County Legislature? There is. This? There is. And um, Cresley supports that bill 100% mm -hmm. um, because those of us who are out there every day, or not every day, who see it mm -hmm. all the time, uh, you see animals with, with plastic in their guts and, uh, mm -hmm. um, and just see, see um, just the, the waste, the garbage. Ride down the street, mm -hmm. go down the highway, look in the trees. I mean, you see what you think are nests in these plastic bags. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason for that. 
Now, as we're getting uh, close to Earth Day now, I'm seeing a lot of people on the uh, City of the Great South Bay Facebook group, local people, people in Lindenhurst, say, uh, organizing local cleanups because it's just gotten so bad. Yeah, it's a sad, I mean, we've had, had to do this for a while. What a sad reality <laughs> that, that we have to spend time cleaning up beaches that should be clean in the first place. Well, failing that, yeah, yeah we gotta we gotta do what we can Absolutely. do now. Absolutely, yeah. and and join any one of those to help mm. educate yourself and educate others. Now, uh, we we saw uh, a couple of unusual whale sightings in in the Sound. Why why have they come back? And you know, I I'm not. No one's entirely sure. I think um, this summer we saw um, humpback whales and belugas in Long Island Sound. Um, I've seen unusual whales in Long Island Sound in the past, a uh, pilot whale that I helped sort of capture back in 1994, um, maybe 96. Um, they're following food, we think. And, and there's, there's this, this year um, and last year a tremendous increase in populations of, of Menhaden. Um, hmm. And or, why is or that? Bunker. Um, partly because of they were... Uh, protected and reduced take. Reduced so catch. we're seeing all the, the bunker come back and we're seeing not only whales coming into the sound, but uh, you know, to your point earlier, a lot of uh, dolphins and seals coming closer to shore. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that part of the mix? Um, to some extent, sure. I mean, actually, I saw uh, seals at Cubside feeding on bunker this mm -hmm. year for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. the first time in a long time. Well, the first time that I saw <laughs> right. it. Right. Yeah. But the point is, I think... Uh, Getting back to the question, what can we do on the mainland? Uh, I'm thinking if, uh, if all these uh, marine mammals uh, eat fish like the, uh, the, uh, the Menhaden and the, uh, the alewife and, and herring at one point, um, I think there's a lot that we can do on the mainland of Long Island to improve those fish runs. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, to allow them to recover um, a lot of the places that have that where historic fish runs are being um, impeded mm -hmm. by by dams. Um, there are fish ladders for some. There are um, mm -hmm. others that may need them, or ultimately those dams need to come down. Mm -hmm. I think we need it's we need to um, do what we can to uh, reduce those impediments, but also to reduce the influx of um, nitrogen and other stuff into our waters. Mm -hmm. um, um, nitrogen as a limiting factor for uh, marine algae, um, and as we, if we don't control, if we don't limit it, we're just going to have more and more problems. Mm, yes, well, that's that's a, a root cause analysis. Uh, certainly, I would I would argue though that uh, opening up these uh, historic fish runs, and by historic, we're talking pre-Dutch in a lot yeah. of cases, because they create all these mills everywhere to uh, to to run their uh, uh, grist mills and mm. however else, but that also had the effect of stopping the fish run. So that Absolutely. systematically, starting then, we've closed off both our, all three of our coasts, uh, you know, north uh, on the Sound, south mm -hmm. on the Great South Bay, and west in the Peconic. So, um, you know, it, it boggles the mind what would happen if we really started to open that up. But you would have, and this, they've done this in Maine, uh, where they've taken down dams, it's really turned around uh, ponds that, that were given over to blue-green algae mm -hmm. because the, the fry would go and eat all the algae, and then it would go out to sea, pulling uh, all those compounds out of the ocean. That's so we can, right. we can have healthier streams and uh, more fish and more uh, seals, dolphins, and whales. Would that Absolutely. be something? Yeah, and, and the consequences of the recovery of those, the, of those predators in our waters um, is not just for them, and there are consequences throughout ecosystems when you um, allow that stuff to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think opening those dams and removing them and allowing the, the flux and the, the flow um, will have absolutely positive effects. And your, your point on uh, you know pesticides earlier was right on. These are top-level predators, which means that all the toxins that we're throwing in, uh, there's that magnification effect you're talking about where uh, it's higher and higher levels as we move up the food chain until we hit these top-level predators. So right. it's really imperative for their sake to not have these uh, chemicals on our lawns and eventually in the waters because it concentrates in them, you know, mercury in, in uh, sword fish, Absolutely. for instance. 
and mercury throughout all of all of them, not just swordfish, but all the every fish out there that feeds on other um, fish and, and other mm -hmm. stuff, except for those that feed on plants, are going to concentrate uh, methylmercury. Mm -hmm. Part of that, of course, is some of the methylmercury in our waters is from burning of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. yeah, Another cool. major yeah. contributor to uh, the issues that mm -hmm. we all face. Yeah, well, a, a big issue I want to talk to you about is uh, ocean acidification. I mean, there's one thing to have, you know, carbon dioxide causing heating in the atmosphere, of, you know, global warming. Um, but one thing that few people know about is the same compound, CO2, is also a major con contributor to ocean acidification. So what are the long-term consequences of that, and what can we do to stop it? Well, the long-term consequences are continued ecosystem disruption. We're talking about changing the pH, and it's not in the future, it's happening now. The pH of the world's oceans are changing. So all those organisms that are dependent upon uh, their skeleton made of, of calcium carbonate limestone, like those clams. So, so, so fish and shellfish, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, and coral and others. And um, they will die, they will disintegrate. Their larval stages are, are not able to, uh, the young stages aren't able to survive. Um, and that has radical consequences. Um, again, the, the way to stop it is to reduce emissions and to increase um, the removal. So you re reduce the sources mm -hmm. and increase um, the removal by increasing the amount of um, uh, plants, mm -hmm. whether it's aquatic plants um, in some places or um, land plants. Mm -hmm. remo Take out, sequester the CO two and met. Mm. So we need we need in part our, our eelgrass back. Yes, I mean, absolutely. We've lost ninety percent of our marshes and eelgrasses since uh, nineteen thirty, and we'll lose it all by twenty thirty. So that's a very important strategy we, we need to adopt. It's a big question: ocean acidification. Oh, absolutely. Because the end the end point is jellyfish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, five, seven hundred million years ago when they evolved, the ocean was mo much more acidic, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, but we don't want to have to go back there and just mm -hmm. eat jellyfish all the time. It yeah. wouldn't be any good. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's all connected. Mm. Well, very good. I think that's a great place to, to, to close. It is indeed all connected. These, uh, the largest creatures that ever uh, have lived on the earth are out there, and, and we right here, uh, you know, right from our... Uh, Front yards can do uh, something to, to help them. Absolutely. Thank you, Artie. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's going to be uh, it for uh, Water Matters. Thanks to our guest, Dr. Artie Kopelman, and to all who contributed to the show this week. We look forward to seeing you all again next week for another perspective on water, because here on Long Island, water matters. <laughs>